Please be seated. Good afternoon. We are pleased to be with you. And we will now call the case of American Slaughterhouse Association versus the United States Department of Agriculture. And when appellants uh, introduce themselves, please let us know how much rebuttal time you intend to retain. With that, we'll get started. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Kate Brindle, and I represent the appellant in this case, the American Slaughterhouse Association. I'll be speaking for 15 minutes on how the Meat Eaters' Right to Know Act, or the Merck Act, is unconstitutional under the First Amendment. And my co-counsel, Claire Corsi, will be speaking about how the act is unconstitutional under the Fourth Amendment. And we would please like to reserve one minute for rebuttal. We're here today asking the court to reverse the district court's decision for two reasons. First, because the Merck Act represents a speech restriction and should therefore be held to the intermediate level of scrutiny. And second, the Meat Eaters' Right to Know Act is not even constitutional under the more lenient standard because it's not rationally related to a substantial government interest. What is the substantial government interest that's involved here? The substantial government interest is the prevention of cruelty to animals, and we concede that that is a, a governmental interest, but that, there, but that the act is not, is not rationally related to that. Um, under both the Central Hudson Standard, which is the intermediate standard, and under Zotterer as well. Is that the only interest? Just treatment of animals. That's, that's the interest that, that the district court specifically spoke to, and that's the interest that's articulated mostly in the legislative history. I, I have a question about the legislative findings. Uh, in evaluating the government's reasons for enacting a statute for the purpose of whatever balancing test we determine is appropriate, are we limited to the stated findings? In other words, if Congress says nothing, we tend to make up whatever reasons they might have had uh, in looking at a rational reason or whatever the standard may be. When there are findings, are we allowed to look beyond those or not? Uh, we would encourage you to, to, look, to look at Congress's findings. That's what the district court did. They well, specific I, I understand that, but what, what are the limitations on our ability to look beyond that, if any? I, um, I don't know that there are limitations. The district court did, however, decide that um, I don't know that it was a legal limitation for them deciding not to look beyond what Congress originally said in the legislative history, but that's a decision they made. And so um, while there not, might be a, not be a legal standard for what you can look to, um, we would respectfully ask that that's what the court, um, that, that they would do that. So this case- Counselor, just so that I'm able to follow you, am I correct in thinking that given the tack you've taken so far, you agree that this is commercial speech that's at issue? Correct. It's commercial speech, and, and it's it's there, it's a twofold reason. So first, the court, um, the Supreme Court in Woolley versus Maynard, um, that court talked about in addition to the right to speak, there's also a right not to speak, and that in conjunction with the Fifth Circuit decision in United States versus Richards, and that case dealt with a statute um, that ha that had the prohibition of crushed videos, so basically small animals being crushed by human feet for entertainment, the dissemination of those videos, and also this circuit in Glick versus Kniff, which was a case that, um, it was a person who was filming a police officer on campus. Um, those two cases talked about how, how the act of videotaping and then disseminating that tape is a speech act. And so our argument is that if- Well, let me stop you there. I mean, the court in, in Glick says that not necessarily that videotaping itself is an act of speech, that it, but that it's a fundamental prerequisite to having people have an open and honest conversation about what public officers are doing when they're executing their governmental functions. So in that sense, Glick versus kind of is a case that says we ought to have more information out there for public discussion. I don't know how you turn that into a case uh, to shut down the free flow of information. Right, so, so our argument is that, that if, you, if you do have the right to videotape and that you have the right to speak, you would have the flip, you would have the opposite and you would have the right not to speak. So what they're essentially doing is forcing these private businesses in unprecedented ways to speak when they want to remain silent. And so these companies don't want the government, don't want the peering eyes of government coming in, videotaping nearly every move of most parts of the slaughterhouses. But, but the, the government could come in if, the, if it were the government. In other words, if an inspector 
with the proper badge came to the door and said, today is inspection day, I'm going to spend the day here. They could do that, correct? That's correct. These slaughterhouses are subject to the Humane so, Methods of Slaughter so Act. What is different about this? Is it that you're speaking to the world, that to private parties and not to the government that makes it a problem? It, the problem is that, is that it's a restriction on silence. So the same way that there's a right to freely speak, there's also a right to have freely have silence. And so at the point that the government comes in and forces these companies to speak, that's when it becomes a problem, and that's when it violates the First Amendment. And How so, do you distinguish the DiMario case uh, in which the court said that, conduct, that, that taking photographs is mere conduct and not, in fact, speech? So the DiMario case was, an, it was a case in the mid-'80s, um, and that, that case specifically references another case, which is U.S. v. 37 photographs. And in that case, the court talked about how the dis it's the dissemination that's the speech act. And so that's what we have a problem with. It's, it's the live streaming. That's when it becomes a speech act. And it becomes because... So if, if, if the government were to say, we're, we're short on inspectors, so what we're going to ask you to do is videotape this and send to the U.S. Department of Agriculture your videotape, and we can inspect at our leisure in that manner. Would that be different in your view? I don't know that that would be different because they're still compelling them to speak when they want to when they want to remain silent. So they're still forcing them to speak. Well, how is that tape. different than sending the person to the plant? Be, because it's the it's the video the, the transmission of the videotape that's the speech act, and so that's but, that. but, but disclosure to the government is different than disclosure to others, is it not? True. But I mean, but so I don't understand where the problem would be in my hypothetical if, if instead of sending a, in, an inspector to you, you sent the visuals to the inspector for examination. And why is that different than sending in your tax returns? Well, I mean, I, th I think it would depend the limits on it. I mean, if it, it's, you know, while it wouldn't be favorable to our clients, it might be more acceptable if, if there were certain well, limits. It doesn't matter whether it's favorable to your clients. The question for us is whether it's constitutional or not. And I'm looking for your uh, explanation of, of where the constitutional line ought to be drawn. So I think that the line would be that when, when you're forcing it to be disseminated across the internet. That, that's what we really have a problem with. It's, it's the fact that, you're, that the government is, is forcing our client to videotape nearly every part of their slaughterhouses. And is anyone, that part of the statute severable? If we agreed with you that it was the public dissemination that was problematic, uh, could we sever that part and just have the part of the statute that requires that the videos be sent to USDA for distribution under FOIA? Well, unfortunately, I mean, the other parts would still fail because the statute is still unconstitutional under Zotter for a couple different reasons. And the other the other issue with it was that it still doesn't directly advance a government interest and it's still overly broad. So if you were to adopt the Central Hudson standard, that standard requires four things. The first is that it's a substantial but government. But if it fails Zotter, need we even bother with Central Hudson? No, I mean, I mean, we would encourage you to to uh, adopt Central Hudson, but if it fails Zotterer, then it would be unconstitutional either way. And I way. thought a moment ago you said it would still be unconstitutional under Zotterer, but then you went on to argue Central Hudson, and I'm wondering what I've missed. So, so Central Hudson is the standard that that we think you should adopt. That's the intermediate level scrutiny standard, and that's the standard that gets applied when you restrict speech. And Spirit Airlines versus U.S. Department of Transportation makes that distinction. But, however, Zotter gets applied when you compel speech. But either way. Um, the act still fails and it's unconstitutional. So we would prefer the intermediate level of scrutiny. But you would agree that it is, and it's been your argument so far, that it would be speech you'd rather not make that's being compelled, which naturally leads to Zotterer, don't you believe? Well, we think that it's a restriction on silence, which is why we would encourage you to apply Central Hudson, because... Well, why isn't that just semantic? I mean, under that rationale, every single commercial disclosure would be a restriction on silence, and Zotterer wouldn't make sense in any context. Well, I mean, I think if you, there's, there's some policy reasons that if you, if you applied Zotterer, that could potentially lead to, any, to untapped government intrusion. So any time that the government was able to articulate um, an interest, the government could basically say, well, we have an interest, and it's rationally videotaping and forcing these companies to stream it across the internet, that's rationally related to that. And, and I mean, there's nothing to stop them from coming to potentially any business. And but doesn't that argument tend to circle back to 
the one you were just, the conversation you were just having with the Chief Justice. Because there, I think you were talking about the difference between federal statute, FMIA, um, allowing observation 24 7 if the person there required it. And the only difference here is now that observation can be recorded. So I, I think you're circling back, and if you're not, help me to better understand your position. Sure. So it's, it's not just that it can be recorded. And so that's true. The inspectors can come in now and, and look at what's going on in the facility. But it's the fact that it's being disseminated across the entire internet. So anyone would have, with internet access, would, for 24-7, could, could watch But another videos. colleague has suggested excising the across the internet transmission. Send it by email. Send it by pouch. So if we take that problem away, what complaint have you left? Right. So th there's there's other problems with the act. And, and the, the one is that it's it's extremely overly broad. So first of all, if, if you look at the penalty provision, that's section 5, A talks about that it would be a slaughter plant, that if they didn't install the video cameras, they would be subject to a $1,000 fine per day. But the B provision talks about a meat company, but it never defines a meat company, that they would be subject to a penalty of $1,000 a day for not having these videos streamed. So that that could potentially lead to any mom and pop farmer who brings their animals to slaughter. Um, they could potentially be be subject to liability for a thousand dollars per day, and so it's overly broad in that way. It's also overly broad because what, what does overbreadth have to do with? First Amendment doctrine. Well, that's so. So the Central Hudson test. There's four prongs of it, and the fourth prong is that it has to be narrowly tailored to meet the need. And so our argument is that this is not narrowly tailored at all. That there's several alternatives that you could do. You could hire more inspectors. You could better train the inspectors. You could um, make more. You could put more animals who are currently exempt from the Humane Slaughter, Methods of Slaughter Act. You could make them part of it. So there's there's other things. Doesn't that you the could legislative do. history suggest that? The government has already tried all of those options and nothing else seems to work? Well, I think the, the legislative history um, it talks about how the USDA is understaffed. And so we would suggest that they could hire more staff members and that they could try harder to enforce their own laws before they basically pass this law that, that's so unfair to our businesses because it, it is so sweeping and, and unprecedented. Um, another reason is that it's not narrowly tailored is that the Merck Act talks about it's not just live animals who are being forced to be videotaped. It's dead animals as well. And so if the goal of the act, if the, if the government interest is preventing cruelty to animals. But see, that's why I asked you about uh, the, the question I started with, which is whether we can look beyond the stated purposes in congressional findings. Because there are health concerns with the way carcasses are dealt with as well. I mean, a consumer may want to know if a carcass sits unrefrigerated for a long time or it has flies sitting on it. I mean, dead or alive, that's, that's potentially something a consumer would want to know. So why, if we look at the interests more broadly, how does that affect your analysis? So it affects it in two ways. So under the Central Hudson test, the Central Hudson test talks about how statutes have to directly advance a government interest. And the Zotterer test talks about how in order when you test uh, reasonably related that you should look at the means that the government's using. And so here it becomes an issue of means. So even if we were to put this law in effect and we install cameras in every slaughterhouse that's uh, subject to the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, there's nothing to indicate that consumers would even watch those videos, that consumers would know if, you know, maybe the piece of meat had a bruise on it or something like that. You know, most, most consumers probably aren't experts on food safety. And so even if they did watch the videos, so, for example, the Smithfield Slaughter Facility in Tar Hill, North Carolina, that facility has 973,000 square feet. So you would have to put cameras, I mean, you would have to essentially put thousands of cameras for people to be in compliance with this act. So there's nothing to indicate that people would even watch the videos. If they did watch the videos, it would essentially be a full-time job. And then if they do watch the videos, that they would even make any sort of change. That Couldn't you would use that very same argument to say, why even have inspectors on site? There's way too much to be inspected. You can't do it. You can't see every brute. I mean, isn't that the very same rationalization that could just say, we'll throw our hands up and no longer inspect meat or how it's produced, dead or alive? Well, our, our, you know, my client, what, they want to be in compliance with this law. They, they want to make sure that Well, it sounds as if your clients would almost rather it simply not exist. 
rather well, I'm, than I'm being in compliance with it. They, I'm, I'm, I apologize. They want to be in compliance with the Humane Slaughter Act, not the, not the Merck Act. We do contend that that's unconstitutional. And so, you know, we, we don't have a problem with, with uh, inspectors coming in and, and looking at our facilities. What we do have a problem with is that this law, that it's so overly broad, and not only is it overly broad, but it's not even guaranteed to work. And so, for I mean, instance... guaranteed to work is not the standard. I mean, under Florida Bar versus went for it, the court says as long as there's some common sense reason to believe that this is going to take steps towards alleviating the problem, it doesn't necessarily have to be the, you know, 100% successful. Well, I would, I would ask your honors to look at 44 Liquor Mart versus Rhode Island, which was a Supreme Court case that said the government must meet the burden of justifying that the proposed law would significantly change consumer behavior. And here, we don't have anything to indicate that consumers would even watch the videos, that they know what they're looking for. But I don't know for. that you're focused on the right test, because if you would assume and just agree with me for the purpose of this discussion, that we're seeking deterrence, maybe not 100% solution, but deterrence. Isn't it better that one knows that he or she is being videotaped and thereby, as you said, more likely to be in compliant with the law? I mean, it's not so, it doesn't matter if it's never watched. What matters is that the person's being filmed know they're being filmed, right? Well, Your Honor, I, I see that my time has expired. You may, you may answer very briefly. Briefly answer. Yeah, we, we do believe that, that it's important to have uh, humane treatment of animals, and that's why we would encourage more inspectors and other alternatives, but not this law that's extremely overbroad, and that's why we would encourage you to reverse the district court. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chief Justice, your honors, and may it please the court. My name is Claire Corsi, and I too represent the appellant, the American Slaughterhouse Association, in this matter. I will be speaking to today's Fourth Amendment issue. The freedom from unreasonable searches is a crucial pillar that supports the ideals of the American patriots that came before us. What, what is a, a, a search? in this case. Where is the search? The search in this case, Your Honor, refers to the intrusion of the eye, so to speak, of the camera, or the cameras that would be forced to be installed in, installed in these slaughterhouse facilities. But the government isn't installing them, as I understand the statute. You're asked to install them yourselves, correct? Correct, Your Honor, but there, I, we would argue that there's a fine line between the government physically installing them themselves and also requiring compliance under, an, under a statute well, such there as the is a line. Act. There is a line. If I, if I asked you to go over there and look into her notebook, am I searching the notebook? No, Your Honor. Well, so if I tell you to put a camera in that she can watch, uh, you know, sitting in her PJs in her living room, is, why is that a search? Your Honor, the difference becomes when it comes in when there are penalties associated with not. No, no, it's either a search or it isn't. Then we worry about whether there are penalties. Why is it? A, why does that that make it a search? Your Honor, a search is an intrusion into uh, a government intrusion into an area where the person being intruded has an expectation of privacy, a reasonable expectation of privacy that the public is ready to accept as reasonable. Well, in this case. Do you think it's wise to argue that slaughterhouses have a reasonable expectation of privacy? I'm sure it wasn't lost on you, your co-counsel's eloquent arguments about one reason we don't need cameras is because there's someone there all the time already. Your Honor, uh, slaughterhouses do indeed enjoy an expectation of privacy. It is somewhat diminished from a regular person in their home and their effects and things like that. And there are standards, there's a standard uh, under New York versus Burger that establishes the expectation of privacy of a closely regulated industry. I would first like to speak to the fact that the appellees argue that our facial challenge, our Fourth Amendment facial challenge that we are bringing is premature. And, and um, we would like to allege that this is not a persuasive argument. The, though um, many Fourth Amendment challenges do travel through a fact-intensive analysis, the Supreme Court has never explicitly prohibited Fourth Amendment challenges that are challenging statutes on their face. But it might do that soon. It just granted cert a few months ago in Patel. Oral arguments in that case are next week. Any reason why we shouldn't just wait and see what the Supreme Court does now that it's faced with the explicit question of whether or not facial challenges under the Fourth Amendment are are permissible? Your Honor, it would be unwise to lay in wait and let this statute become, go into effect as it is scheduled to go into effect very soon. Well, and but, but we could issue a stay 
of the statute while we wait for the Supreme Court? Why would we go into this very difficult legal analysis when it might become irrelevant in a few months? Your Honor, it would be a disservice to the Fourth Amendment and the Constitution to remain silent on this issue. It is such to wait for the Supreme Court to tell us what the answer is? Why, why is that a disservice? Your Honor, this court is not powerless. It is under, obviously under binding precedent from the Supreme Court, but this, this court has been granted the authority to make decisions and make declarations as a, as a circuit court. As, a, as precedent has indicated, the, though the Supreme Court says that facial Fourth Amendment challenges are not usual, it indeed indulged in such a facial challenge in Berger versus New York in 1967. The court ruled that a wiretapping statute was unconstitutional on its face because it allowed police to wiretap people's phones without providing probable cause. And because of the glaring inconsistencies between the original goal of the Fourth Amendment, which was to protect against general warrants and general searches, and the text of this New York statute, the court was able to strike down the statute on its face. When a statute would rob people of a procedural safeguard of the Fourth Amendment, that's when a facial challenge would be appropriate, albeit typically unusual. Wouldn't it at least be better to wait until we have a specific slaughterhouse so we can see sort of what their track record is of violations, whether they've been cited before, how often inspectors are there? Uh, all of that seems to be relevant to the question of, of uh, potentially the substantiality of the interest, but certainly to how, uh, how well the statute furthers those interests as against a particular slaughterhouse. Your Honor, respectfully, no. It would not be wise or it would not be preferable to wait because when, when a statute is unconstitutional on its face, it, doesn't, it lacks sense to only provide relief in a specific instance if that act would be unconstitutional in every outcome. Um, the similarities between Berger, the 1967 Berger case and our case are very striking. In, in this case, the Merck Act Authorize, it provides no warrant requirement. There's no probable cause. It applies a one-size-fits-all monitoring system to but there's every- there's tradition for that, isn't there, in other industries? Weapons industry, mining industry, warrantless searches? What distinguishes slaughterhouse industries from those? Your Honor, the, um, the industries that you were referencing are, do also fall under the closely regulated industry standard mm -hmm. established in 1987 New York versus Burger, Burger with a U, somewhat confusingly. Um, it, the Berger exception requires that three things be present for warrantless inspections of closely regulated industries. It requires that the warrantless search be in furtherance of a regulatory scheme uh, that the government has a substantial interest in, and that the warrantless searches are necessary to further that regulatory scheme, and finally, that the warrantless searches, that the statute that uh, authorizes these searches provides a constitutionally adequate substitute. Um, we acknowledge that the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act and the Federal Meat Inspection Act would lend to the notion that the government cares about the processing of animals for food. We also recognize, as did the lower court, that the slaughterhouse industry is closely regulated and that the government does maintain a substantial interest. However, the three-pronged burger test is conjunctive. So even if it passes the first standard and it fails one or two of the remaining standards, it still fails. What, what, what uh, specific prong does it fail in your view? Your Honor, it fails both the second and the third prong. Meaning? The second prong refers to the necessity of the warrantless searches. It says that the warrantless searches must be necessary to further the government's interest in the regulatory scheme. And I take it you would have the same view as your colleague that human individual people coming to inspect is uh, sufficient. Your Honor, I would even go a step further than my co-counsel suggested, and I, I would agree with her as well. The legislative history points out several of the shortcomings of the existing laws, and it almost offers, it does offer, a, an insight into potential alternatives for, uh, to the Merck Act. So as my co-counsel mentioned, hiring more staff, broadening their responsibilities and their understanding of the food industry so they're not just looking for salmonella, they're also making sure they look for abuses. Additionally, le the legislative history at page four discusses that there are no adequate labeling systems in place so far to inform consumers that their animals were processed humanely. So perhaps there could be some initiative to expand this labeling system. We didn't so always- the, the meat industry is agreeing to mandatory labels on meat packages about how, about past violations of the HMSA? 
I'm sorry, did you ask if we are agreeing to that? Yeah, is that something that the meat industry would not oppose? It seems that in conjunction with other potential less intrusive options, it would be more favorable. I'm not, not entirely sure if I speak for the entire meat industry, but it, it, there are alternatives. As my co-counsel mentioned, more staff, additional labels, and also perhaps more, more stringent penalties. As my co-counsel- You know, Congress doesn't have to pick the best way to do something as long as it picks a way that passes constitutional muster. And so far, really what you said is, well, there's something out there we would like a lot better because we, we think it would be less burdensome to mm -hmm. us and we would have to show a little bit less of what we do. But I'm not sure why that equates to a Fourth Amendment violation. Your Honor, it equates to a Fourth Amendment violation because these the three alternatives, more penalties, more extensive labels, and more staff, demonstrate that there are other means of other means of achieving the same goals. However, even if this court does not find the the necessity prong argument um, persuasive, the Merck Act blatantly fails the third prong of the Burger Test. And the third prong requires that there be a constitutionally adequate substitute for a warrant whenever these searches happen. So there needs to be a notice requirement, and granted, the notice has been given. But the part that it really fails on is the there needs to be boundaries of a limited search. The scope of the search needs to be limited. And here, there's well, an example. in this case. I mean, it says the specific places. It might be a lot of places, but all of those places are necessary to effectuate the interest of the statute. And it says everywhere that there are animals. And if that's the interest of the statute, it might be a broad scope, but it's not an overbroad scope, is it? Your Honor, it is, it is overbroad. Based on, there is an enumerated list, and then it also says, and processing areas. And that is less specific than the first, the first few items in the list. But how, however, well, it also- Well, if you don't understand what processing means, and it's your business, I, I'm not really sure why that's too vague. It's not that the appellant doesn't, it's not that we don't understand the term processing areas, Your Honor. It's that every slaughterhouse is different, and every slaughterhouse goes about um, they're processing in a different way. Right, which is why they can't be more specific than to say we want these cameras wherever the processing occurs, correct? Re respectfully, Your Honor, there could be, um, the list that precedes the phrase and processing areas is relatively exhaustive, demonstrating that the, the Merck Act legislators understood so, the industry. So no matter so how you read it, it doesn't include the front office where they answer the phones, it doesn't include the restrooms and the changing areas and the showers. I guess I'm not really sure why it's overbroad uh, or insufficiently descriptive of the specifics. It's insufficiently descriptive of the temporal restrictions as well. It mentions that the videotaping will be of any area where animals are present or where animals are handled, carcasses or live bodies. However, the statute does not specifically say that the video recording will only take place if animals are there at that time. This may this has the potential to infect, affect the employees, the managers of the facility, as well as anyone just passing through. It blatantly is, is specifically silent on how for how long the intrusion will take place or over what hours. Um, well, isn't that all the more reason why the audiovisual recording is superior to having a live person move from place to place? Because it would reduce costs. It simply would be the installation and the maintenance and the cost of the recording equipment. And it would be on all the time in those limited areas, the processing areas as discussed. It's redundant to what already exists statutorily and is explained in the regulations. You heard your colleagues speak to this, and I'd like to understand why you don't think that redundancy isn't made more economically feasible by being replaced by the recording Merck suggests. Your Honor, I, I would again point to the fact that it's, it's broad and it's, it's not narrowly defined in its scope. It's not but it's already being done. I see this as an easier, more efficient way to do the same thing, except it might not miss as much as a human being might. What's your response to that? My response to that, Your Honor, is while it, you may believe it's more effective, we still have to ab abide by the Fourth Amendment. And, um, and well, I like to think that that's my goal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so I mean, it may be more efficient, but you have to do it in a, a constitutionally permissible way. It has to be done. The means have to be uh, have to be justified. I think I, I share this sort of sort of your concern that there it is quite 
pervasive. I mean, to put an entire facility under constant surveillance is troubling. But if you look at the scope of the Federal Meat Inspection Act, there are already inspectors there at all times when it's operational. They have regulatory authority to, to enter after hours. Why don't the arguments that you're making eradicate the entire federal meat inspection scheme? Because, Your Honor, the Merck Act represents the next step, and the step that it takes is too far. It goes beyond the bounds. It pushes even the boundaries of the Federal Meat Inspection Act and goes beyond that and does so in a way that provides unprecedented intrusion into the premises of these closely regulated industries. And because, it is, because the Merck Act is overly broad and allows this intrusion, it fails under the Berger exception. And therefore, this court should reverse the lower court's decision to dismiss, recognizing the act as unconstitutional. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, counsel. We'll hear from the appellees. <laughs> Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the Court. My name is Sophie Guilfoyle. I represent the U.S. Department of Agriculture. I will be addressing the American Slaughterhouse Association's First Amendment challenge to the Meat Eaters' Right to Know Act. Seated at council table with me is Scott Lake. He will be addressing ASA's Fourth Amendment challenges to the Merck Act. Your Honors, this case is about whether a heavily regulated industry that consistently violates federal law can use the First Amendment to withhold factual information from the government and consumers. We offer three points in support of affirmance of the district court's finding that the Merck Act is constitutional under the First Amendment. First, the Merck Act compels conduct and not expression on behalf of American Slaughterhouse Association's members. Second, should this court find that the Merck Act compels expression, that expression is a compelled commercial disclosure subject to deferential rational basis review under Zotterer. Third, under Zotterer, we need only show that there are substantial or in fact, under Zotter are adequate government interests that are reasonably related to, uh, that the regulatory scheme, excuse me, uh, is reasonably related to the substantial government interests. Is there any other industry that could, uh, that you could envision the same kind of requirement being used in and should that inform our analysis? For example, could Congress require videotaping of uh, the making of trucks at Freightliner Corporation so that truck buyers could decide for themselves if they seemed safe enough? Or could um, Walmart be required to post cameras so people can decide whether they treat their employees well enough? I mean, where does this stop? Or does it? Can Congress just mandate that? Or sort of the, it, the internet writ large? Your Honor, in order for this regulatory framework, of the video surveillance and, and live streaming, to be effective or reasonably related to accomplishing the goals, you would have to be able to assess um, the substantial interest of place aesthetically. Um, so for instance, in toy manufacturers, pharmaceutical companies, um, in those types of industries, whatever visual information you're collecting would have to speak to the government interest at play. Well, in um, my hypotheticals, it certainly does. I mean, uh, car safety is very important, and employee rights. There are a lot of statutes that guarantee the good treatment of employees. and. Toys need to be safe, too. Why wouldn't this just open up everything if we say that this is okay? And in fact, in your introduction, you seem to suggest that it doesn't need, even need to be a substantial interest. So if it's something that's merely adequate, you could add a whole host of lists to Judge Graber's examples. Yes, and if sure. I may add on, I think what we're asking is, what is merely adequate? How do you distinguish that from just idle curiosity? Consumers want to know. Yes, Your Honor. Um, Im important in this, is if the court should find that this, that this video surveillance requirement compels expression, um, then the statute would be reasonably related uh, to preventing substantial interests or adequate interests. Um, the issue or what distinguishes the present case is the extent, of, the extent of recalcitrance on behalf of the slaughterhouse industry. In 2010, this nation witnessed the largest recall, meat recall in national history um, due to consistent noncompliance on behalf of well, ASA we've just, members. We've just seen some of the largest automobile recalls in history as well. So can Congress ask uh, General Motors and, and the other car manufacturers to install 
hundreds of video cameras so everybody can watch? Is Your that Honor, okay? If traditional regulatory framework has failed to bring an industry, industry into compliance and that failure results in a danger to American consumers or in this case to extensive cruelty to animals, then we would argue yes, it's within the government's power to, uh, to, effect, to accept a means um, of enforcing existing federal law. It, it just strikes me as really a curiosity to say that the government has been unable to enforce its own statutes through normal means, and so we're throwing it open to the public to do so, uh, to sort of put, put these people in the stocks and, and let the community uh, deal with the shame. Uh, of these individuals, it, it just, uh, I have a great deal of difficulty seeing that uh, Congress has the ability to do that uh, by, by requiring really everything except the most intimate details uh, be placed on the internet. Your Honor, the dissemination of the information um, informs consumers and speaks to the second interest at play, whereas preventing animal abuse and ensuring compliance with the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act and the Federal Meat Inspection Act would still be up to USDA inspectors as private citizens may not be qualified to determine by looking at this footage whether animals were slaughtered in compliance with existing federal legislation. Um, so is the tolerance 100 percent compliance? Is that it if we're not receiving or believed to have 100 percent compliance with the Federal Meat Inspection Act and the Humane Slaughter Act video recording is the only other step necessary, the only other step that's likely to bring that about? Your Honor, the government expects that there will be isolated incidents of noncompliance in any industry, um, whether mm -hmm. deliberately or, or through mistake or error. Um, however, the level of recalcitrance of the slaughterhouse industry, as documented by animal undercover animal activists uh, in these facilities, is astounding. Um, well, you heard opposing counsel say, no one's even going to watch these horrific videos. It's not going to deter the treatment that you believe exists. What's your response to that? Your Honor, the government's position is that having video surveillance in slaughterhouses would certainly deter um, bad actors from abusing animals or violating federal law uh, if they knew that there would be accurate visual data collected uh, implicating. Didn't work for bank robbers. Excuse me? They, folks rob banks all the time and know they're being videotaped in the doing. Hasn't changed it one bit. Your Honor, just because a statute is not, or, or a law is not 100 percent effective does not mean that it should be uh, implemented. People still commit a number of, of egregious crimes, yet there are still laws on the books prohibiting such conduct. Y your, your comment that members of the lay public are not capable of determining whether the uh, Humane Slaughter Act is being followed or not uh, leads me to wonder what the real purpose of the statute is. If, if the sort of great masses of people who, who may or may not decide to watch this can't tell whether the law is being followed, then what possible purpose is served by the, by the statute? Is it merely uh, Congress's effort to try to talk people out of eating meat? And if so, is that a legitimate purpose? No, Your Honor. We believe the meat-eating public understands that in order for them to have meat for consumption that animals must be slaughtered. Um, the visual information that would be conveyed to members of the public in this situation um, would allow them to make more informed choices and essentially vote with their wallets, um, while USDA inspectors would be qualified to determine where, whether there are violations of federal law occurring. One then, of then why shouldn't these videos just be sent to USDA and not disseminated publicly? That is an option under the Merck Act, Your Honor. If, if an individual slaughterhouse or a mom and pop operation that is federally regulated, um, as the statute only applies to federally regulated slaughterhouses, does not keep a website, then they may submit this information to the USDA, which is available to the public through a FOIA request. Um, so that is still an option available to the slaughterhouses. The reason that the Merck Act asks slaughterhouses with websites to disseminate this information is for efficiency and to more effectively inform consumers and remove well, I mean, the government as an intermediary. If the point of the act, or one of the reasons, or the main purpose is to facilitate enforcement of the HMSA, why does the act include poultry, and why does it apply to slaughterhouses that receive a custom exemption from inspection that aren't inspected by the USDA at all? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, 
the poultry issue is a difficult question to address uh, for the government as traditionally poultry have been exempted under the Animal Welfare Act and the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. Nonetheless, uh, conditions in poultry facilities, regardless of whether there are violations of federal law at play, um, may still be of interest to consumers. Um, surely there's a broad spectrum of the humane handling and mechanized slaughter of poultry, uh, and consumers may want that information to decide which companies they give their money to. Uh, to essentially vote with their wallets. I think that also speaks to an important policy underlying First Amendment jurisprudence regarding commercial dis disclosures. Um, it, in cases of compelled commercial disclosure where the government is allowing more access to factual, truthful information, um, the courts have deferential review of those compulsions as they increase consumer awareness. When the government is restricting a commercial entity's ability to speak or convey information to the public, there's more exact scrutiny uh, as it restricts the free flow of information. In the present case, the Merck Act allows consumers and regulating agencies better access to information and therefore is favored under First Amendment jurisprudence. How do you distinguish the M story case that says that sort of satisfying consumer curiosity is not a substantial government interest and if it were then there's a circularity there that anything someone wants to know about the government can force a business to, to disclose? Your Honor, Amistoy, in Amistoy it was unclear um, why the court adopted the reasoning that a restriction or a refrain restricting a company's right to refrain from speaking was not a compelled commercial disclosure. It was unclear in Amistoy while, why the court chose intermediate scrutiny under Central Hudson as opposed to Zotterer. Uh, and the language of satisfying consumer curiosity, we believe belittles the legitimate consumer interests that are in play here. Consumers have deep-seated religious, moral, ethical, dietary uh, choices that underlie which food they purchase, um, deeply held beliefs that we believe are a substantial government interest. Um, furthermore, I would like to speak to a point that Council made earlier. Um, the Supreme Court held in Central Hudson that the court may not speculate as to interests that are not explicitly stated in the legislative history or in the statue on its face. Therefore, while we would like to argue, and we believe it's implicit that the Merck Act has food, health, and safety implications, um, the government's purported interests in implementing the statute uh, are to inform consumers and prevent animal abuse. Uh, and we believe that those interests are substantial. The Humane Methods of Slaughter Act and that there are anti-cruelty statutes uh, in, on, the state, on the books in states across the United States and further that there have been legal principles that go back to the founding prohibiting unnecessary in suffering or inflicting unnecessary suffering on animals speaks to the substantiality of the interest of preventing cruelty to animals. May I take you back to another point just so that I'm clear on where you stand on this. It seems that you have drawn a bright line between Central Hudson and Zotterer, whereas I think case law allows for some graying or blending of that line. I'm thinking of the Roe case, wherein it seems to indicate that deception may not be necessary. And because Zotterer was ruled on a few years later, with Central Hudson already standing, and I wonder if you are drawing a bright line, as it seems that you are, and if so, you believe you're on the Lauderer side of the line, and if you're not drawing a bright line, you can simply answer the question by telling me that. Um, yes, Your Honor, we do believe that a, a, bright line, a brighter line is emerging um, that states that Zotterer applies to cases of compelled commercial disclosure, whereas Central Hudson... So you mean a blurring of the line? A blurring of the line, perhaps, Your Honor. Um, in Roe, this circuit strongly suggested um, that deferential review may be appropriate when there are government interests in play other than curing consumer deception. Um, the district court, and we concede that there is no deliberate deception uh, at issue in this case. However, when, when consumers purchase a product, especially meat or food for human consumption, we believe that there's an assumption, uh, as there should be, that that product was produced in compliance with federal law. However, unfortunately, uh, largely in the slaughter industry, that is not the case. And we believe that there, there's an implied deception there, um, that this is factual information, that the consumers have a right to know that the slaughterhouse perhaps would rather not disclose, uh, which is the standard in Zotterer. Uh, is, is, there, is there a, what I would label, for lack of a better term, a business right of privacy, a right not to disclose? Your Honor, um, apart, apart from trade secrets or 
things of that nature. Um, Your Honor, the right to privacy, um, while it, it is at play in the Fourth Amendment, or excuse me, in the First Amendment, uh, is more explicitly stated uh, in, in the Fourth Amendment, which my co-counsel will speak to, uh, we believe that the right to withhold factual, truthful information from consumers um, that commercial entities would simply rather not disclose uh, should not be deemed a privacy interest. Um, many companies exist at the pleasure of consumers uh, and should release information that helps the consumers demand that allows consumers to make better choices. For instance, uh, the DC Circuit and American Meat Institute held that labeling country of origin in order to satisfy consumer interest um, was an intra, a government interest sufficient enough to overcome the deferential review under Zauderer and even went further to suggest that that would be a substantial interest. Um, the DC Circuit stated that encompassed within um, the the consumer's interest in the country of origin of their meat were health care, dietary, um, dietary preferences, and also the preference to spend money domestically as opposed to abroad. Similarly, consumers... Well, can we maybe just take a quick step back? I mean, it may be that neither Central Hudson nor Zotterer applies if this isn't commercial speech in the first place. Um, in AMI, we're talking about labels on a package, which is proposing a transaction, which is how the Supreme Court has characterized commercial speech. This is not proposing a transaction. In fact, it's something that the business doesn't want to say in the first place. Why isn't this compelled non-commercial speech and therefore strict scrutiny under Riley? Um, I see I'm out of time. May I briefly answer yes, your Yes, please. Um, commercial speech, the Supreme Court has held, is speech that proposes a purely transactional uh, transaction, or is purely transactional in nature, excuse me. Um, most speech that commercial entities engage, engage in are related to their business practices and therefore are purely transactional or financial in nature. Therefore, we strongly believe that should this court find that the Merck Act compels speech uh, and not simply conduct, that that is certainly commercial speech that falls within Zauderer and Central Hudson jurisprudence. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, counsel. Good afternoon, Your Honors. My name is Scott Lake, and I represent USDA. May it please the court, I will address the Fourth Amendment challenge to the Merck Act. The Merck Act satisfies the Fourth Amendment because it authorizes reasonable administrative inspections of a heavily regulated industry that has shown extraordinary indifference to federal law and consumer outrage. Why is it a search at all or an inspection? Your Honor, we would first argue that this is not a search. And the search does not occur on slaughterhouse premises, and it is rather more akin to the exist um, to um, excuse me. It is more akin to a disclosure requirement um, than a search. Moreover, a search requires a legitimate expectation of privacy, which in this case is lacking. Slaughterhouses. Directly going to my point, why do we need Merck when we already have the Federal Meat Inspection Act and the Humane Slaughter Act and 24 hours access and even the right to have your laundry done on site if the inspector so requires it? Why this extra expensive step? Your Honor, the extra step is needed due to this particular industry's tendency to flout the law and this particular industry's disregard for laws such as the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, which persist um, despite then the existing regulatory scheme. Then maybe Merck should be modified to apply to the processing plants that have been shown to be non-compliant instead of the overbreath application you heard your opposing counsel complain about. Your Honor, the concern, the USDA's concern and Congress's concern in passing this act is uh, the industry's um, overbroad noncompliance, so to speak, in that this um, noncompliance has become so common in the industry that they consider it merely a cost of doing business. For example, the Government Accounting Office in one 12-month period uncovered 553 separate violations of the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. This, the problem of undercover videos is not a new one and has been, and these videos have been servicing for decades. The Humane Methods of Slaughter Act has been in place since, 1950, or since 1958, and since that time, unfortunately, has done little to change slaughterhouse practices in spite, 
in spite of the fact that it imposes both civil and criminal penalties. You heard me compare Merck's recording requirements to the video recording that goes on at banks and does little to deter bank robberies. What makes you think compliance will result from the recording at slaughterhouses? Your Honor, the Merck Act is based on the principle that when somebody is being videotaped, when somebody is subject to public scrutiny, they are more likely to behave ethically, to behave honestly, and to behave lawfully. And while so this then does it matter to you whether it goes across the internet as opposed to directly to the USDA, as has been suggested? Your Honor, the, because the purpose of this act is, is in large part deterrence, um, there, um, it could be served by disclosure simply to USDA. However, the public is already entitled to this information under the Freedom of Information Act. And this statute is simply, or the video streaming requirement, excuse me, is simply an efficiency measure which anticipates widespread public demand for this information once it becomes available. Because the public is already entitled to possess this information, and in fact, because the public may already possess this information in a, um, in a record form rather than a visual recording form, um, no additional intrusion of privacy occurs under the Merck Act as opposed to the existing regulatory scheme in FOIA. The, pl the place where I see a disconnect between the avowed purpose of the statute and the actual provisions of it is in this sort of peculiar two-track uh, system where if a company has a website, the material is sent out to the entire world, and if they don't, it goes to USDA rather than sending it all to USDA that has the power and the knowledge to enforce the, the statutes that at least apply to, the, to mammals, if not to poultry. And I wonder whether that uh, system is, is rationally related to the purposes that Congress stated. Your Honor, the, the video streaming requirement is rationally, rationally related in that it makes the Merck Act's underlying purpose and underlying mechanism more feasible for the government to carry out. It anticipates widespread demand, which in the absence of the video streaming requirement would require the government to process a large number of FOIA requests and to handle a large amount of information that's being submitted to them by slaughterhouses. Well, this, that's pure speculation. How, how, how do you know there would be a lot of FOIA requests? I mean, how do you know how many plants even have a website? Your Honor, that information is not apparent from the record. It's not in the record, and right. That's my point exactly. So you're just guessing that it would be harder to do it the way that I've suggested. But wouldn't that be more closely aligned with the congressional purpose? Your Honor, the the fact that we are speculating here about the Merck Act's implementation speaks to um, the uh, unadvisable nature of a facial challenge in this case, which ASA brings. ASA has brought this case a full year before the act is due to go into effect and before any of its members have experienced what may, you know, what could be considered an invasion of their privacy interests. Well, in First Amendment jurisprudence, it's not unusual to allow a complaint to be brought against a statute before the statute is broken, before there's noncompliance. Perhaps we should borrow that jurisprudence and import it into for Fourth Amendment. What do you think of that? Your Honor, the Fourth Amendment is different from the First Amendment in that it applies to, um, it prohibits unreasonable searches by government agents. It applies to a more factual context and applies a rule of reasonableness, whereas the First Amendment um, imposes a strict prohibition on Congress itself against passing a law which abridges the freedom of speech. Because and in both cases, the harm is the same. If someone is forced to break the law before they can challenge it, they're facing either prison time or exorbitant fees. The Merck Act assesses a, a fee of $1,000 a day, and that seems like a pretty high price to pay uh, for someone to challenge the constitutionality of the statute. Yes, Your Honor. Arguably, it would be um, burdensome to slaughterhouses to either comply or not comply with this law. The true extent of the burden is unclear, as it is a facial challenge, and we are speculating as to the actual effect this will have on the slaughterhouse facilities. However, in this case, other substantial interests weigh in favor of waiting for an as-applied challenge besides the cost on the individual facilities themselves. 
And these are very fundamental interests, including allowing the democratic process to fully express itself um, and avoid overly broad constitutional rulings where a more narrow ruling would be um, adequate to protect ASA's members from unconstitutional intrusions. Well, but wouldn't the standard for determining a facial challenge take care of that problem? In other words, for a statute to be facially unconstitutional, there can be no application of it that would be permissible. So wouldn't simply applying that standard take care of the, the problem and, and not to cut it off before we look for that? Yes, Your Honor, that standard um, would address the problem that, that you mentioned. And in this case, applying that standard, standard yields the conclusion that ASA has not carried their burden in showing that no situation exists in which this act would be valid. So you're not saying there are no facial challenges, you're just saying they're really difficult and they don't meet the standard? Yes, Your Honor, and actually at, at this moment, um, the question of whether facial challenges are permissible under the Fourth Amendment is um, before the Supreme Court in Los Angeles versus Patel, and their opinion, or that case is currently being argued, and um, that question remains um, in essence in limbo for the moment. Would, would the government consent to staying enforcement of the statute pending the outcome of the Supreme Court's decision in Patel? Your Honor, it is the government's position that this statute is, regardless of the validity of a facial challenge in this case, the statute is constitutional on its face. And that's because it, um, from the text of the statute itself, it satisfies the three-part Burger test of substantial government interest, necessity, and limiting the scope. So your preference would be for us to say it doesn't matter what the Supreme Court decides because even if there is a facial challenge, it is unsuccessful. That's your position as I understand it? Yes, Your Honor. Um, our position is that a facial challenge is inadvisable and a more um, complete factual context would yield a more informed decision and a more appropriate source of precedent for um, all parties going forward. However, should the court accept ASA's facial challenge, the act still satisfies the Fourth Amendment on its face. First, the act um, supports two substantial government interests in preventing the unnecessary um, infliction of pain upon livestock animals and in satisfying um, widespread consumer interest as to the origins of their food and regarding the practices of the companies that produce their food. If there's widespread consumer interest, why isn't there a market solution to this problem? Couldn't those companies that feel like they have something to brag about voluntarily install cameras and stream their videos and then people could buy from those companies? Your Honor, the, the problem in this case is that labeling reveals very little about the slaughterhouse's actual practices in regarding the humane treatment of animals. Um, this industry I'm not talking has shown about labeling. I'm talking about people voluntarily doing what the Merck Act requires, and therefore sort of setting themselves apart from uh, the rest of the industry. <laughs> Excuse me, I, I misinterpreted the question. Uh, the a voluntary um, market-based solution, as you say, would be incomplete, as um, consumers would still be faced with. Um, uncertainty in the food that they were purchasing. And additionally, it neglects the other substantial interest in this case, um, which is the humane treatment of animals. And that interest would not be served in those facilities which did not um, install cameras and did not stream the footage. Um, abuse of animals continues, as I mentioned before, in spite of the traditional regulatory scheme, the HMSA. So because the Merck Act serves two fund, um, substantial government interests and not one, the entire, the act's entire mechanism is necessary in order to ensure that, um, in order to ensure the government's purposes are furthered. May um, I ask, you heard there was some exchange about whether or not the Merck Act is properly constrained. I think uh, opposing counsel conceded that there was notice given, but there is a concern that shared by this jurist that there may not be the appropriate constraint on arbitrary enforcement. Why the wide language or the uh, overbreath, and I think I agree with my colleague that overbreath is not a Fourth Amendment um, analysis point, but why cameras in all of the places that it appears Merck allows, in fact, Merck requires to avoid penalty? Your Honor, the, 
the breadth of the search in this case um, speaks to the interest You're involved. agreeing it's a search now? The breadth of for the, the recording? Well, for the purposes of our, of our discussion Understood. here, and under, for a burglar to apply a search, uh, the court must find that there is a search. And while we'd argue that there is not a search, should the court find so under Berger, um, the, the breadth of, of the videotaping that hap in this case speaks to the interests involved, and these interests um, concern um, human health, consumer interest, and the humane treatment of animals, and that's why the act limits its search to areas of the slaughterhouses where animals are present, where animals are processed, and where carcasses are kept. In this way, the Merck Act ensures that slaughterhouses um, comply with HMSA and that consumers are fully informed about the nature of the food that they purchase, while at the same time limiting the search in a, ma in a manner that um, respects the slaughterhouse's limited privacy interests in other areas. The search does I, not extend I, I follow to the argument insofar as it requires that uh, videotape be sent to USDA, but I remain troubled assuming that there is a search about sort of sending everything out. Suppose uh, TSA is overburdened and they feel that people are getting through airports uh, with things they ought not have, can they just video stream this in case members of the public might be interested in these searches and uh, can help police that? Is that, I mean, is that okay to sort of hand off that function to the public? Your Honor, the, the, the TSA's function would implicate serious national security interests and would render the information that they gather um, substantially different from the information in this no, case. No, it isn't really. It's just it somebody, uh, you know, bring a kitchen knife, uh, either intentionally or by mistake. I'm not sure that it's always about national security. I guess my concern is what, I, I used that example because that clearly is a search. Yes. And unlike here where there's a question whether it's a search at all. But, but why is it okay to just say, okay, you're going to search council over here, but uh, just send it out and, and people randomly can observe. Your Honor, the, the issue is that the, the public is already entitled to the information which the Merck Act gathers from slaughterhouses. The same does not apply to TSA searches at airports because of the national security interests involved. And the Freedom of Information Act would entitle the public to the footage gathered at slaughterhouses, whether it was live streamed or not. I see that I am out of time. Um, may I briefly conclude? Yes, you may. All right. Thank you, Your Honor. The Merck Act is constitutional under the Fourth Amendment because it authorizes a reasonable um, data gathering scheme which furthers the government's interests in preventing unnecessary suffering and informing consumers. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Uh, you have uh, one minute left for rebuttal. Judge Liebman, I would simply like to point to um, a good point that you made during opposing counsel's uh, argument. By not allowing the Fourth Amendment facial challenge of a statute of this nature, the government is essentially almost encouraging or mandating that the slaughterhouses violate the Merck Act or violate any other type of act in order to get relief. And that's not something that we want to encourage the government to, to require of anyone seeking relief from a facially uh, deficient statute. So that, um, that concludes my point on rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. The case just argued uh, is taken under advisement, and we are adjourned. And uh, we will return. <laughs>